Traveling within the Apple ecosystem, especially when crossing borders, can get complicated. Usually you want to pack as light as possible, and not only do you have to worry about bringing the right gear in that sense, but also how that gear works and where it works as well. Things like mobile plans can be problematic, there can be unknown conditions, and frankly the way that you use your stuff probably just isn't the same as it is at home, and recently I experienced all of those problems. Within the last couple of weeks, I traveled a total of 1,500 miles or 2,400 kilometers from Canada to the US and back again. And in that time, I wanted to learn how to most effectively live within the Apple ecosystem. And that's what I want to share today. I want to go over what worked, what didn't, and just some helpful tips that I came across along my journey. So if you're planning a trip soon yourself, or you're just curious about my experience, stick around and let's get into it. Hey everyone, Kyle Erickson here. It's not very often that I take trips or go on vacations. Usually I'm just working at home on these videos or if I'm out of the house, it's within the city that I live in. And for the most part, everything stays pretty predictable with my tech. Taking a break last week and traveling somewhere new gave me the opportunity to recharge a bit, but also opened up a whole new set of problems. The way that I'd be using all of my devices was a little bit different and there's no way that I was gonna take everything that I own with me, so. The first thing that I had to do was decide what was worthy of bringing with me. Obviously bringing my phone and my Apple Watch were a must because I use and wear them every day. I had a little bit of an issue with my watch on the trip that I'll get into in a bit, but outside of those things, I had to think about what I actually wanted to do while I was gone. I did kind of want to unplug, but I was pretty sure that I'd be editing photos or want to browse the web at the very least which left me with the choice of bringing an iPad or the MacBook Air. I chose to bring the MacBook Air because I just like browsing the web and editing stuff on Mac OS versus iPad OS, and the battery life is a little bit better as well. Beyond that, I thought I might do some gaming if I had any downtime, so I brought along my Backbone 1 controller, and I threw in my AirPods in the event that I'd want to listen to something without disturbing anyone or if I wanted to tune anything out. As far as any other genuine Apple branded gear goes, my keychain and wallet both have AirTags in them. These are something that I use all the time, especially when I misplace something, which happens pretty frequently, but with traveling, they're really handy in the event that you lose either of these. If I'm on vacation or somewhere new, I'm generally moving around a lot. And if I were to drop my keys or my wallet somewhere, at least I'll have a general idea of where I left them. Or if you're staying in a hotel with a valet, you can see if someone decided to go for a joyride in your car or something as well. All things considered, that's a pretty light load, but the first problem that I came across with all this stuff is how I was going to effectively charge all of it without bringing a bunch of cables or power bricks with me everywhere that I go. If I were to take a charger for my MacBook, my phone, Apple Watch, plus any other accessories, I'd end up having a boatload of stuff that would not only take up more space, but I'd have to remember each time that I packed up and went anywhere, and that's where this GAN charger comes in. With this, I can plug in my phone, my MacBook, and even charge my camera battery or something else if I want to, all simultaneously. And because all these devices use USB-C now, I can just bring a couple USB-C cables with me, and that's all I really need to worry about. When it comes to charging my watch and my AirPods, I charge both of those wirelessly through this little portable Apple Watch charger from ESR. If you guys watched my budget desk setup video, you'll have seen this before, and this is actually part of a 3-in-1 charging stand that I really like, but the watch portion of it is detachable, and it is great for traveling. My only complaint with it is I wish the USB end was just a little bit longer. I find that with my GAN charger having a slight concave surface, it doesn't always go in enough to stay powered. It was finicky enough that I ended up just plugging it directly into my Mac and charging it that way, but next time around, I'll probably stick with a GAN charger with a flat surface, but in any case, that was a pretty minor issue. That stuff is great for charging in a hotel room or something like that, but if I'm driving or I'm out on the go, things change there quite a bit. I find that when I'm mobile in places I'm unfamiliar with, I'm often using maps to find out what direction I need to be going in, and that coupled with everything else happening on my phone, things like taking pictures or videos and so on, makes the battery drain a lot faster. That's where these power banks come in really handy. I've got this MagSafe one from ESR that's 10,000 milliamp hours, which will give me a few full charges on my iPhone, 
These can be a lifesaver, say, if you're out touring in an unfamiliar city and you know that you're going to need to order an Uber or something like that. It just removes any anxiety with worrying if your battery is going to die on you. If you've got access to a vehicle and you're driving a new-ish car, it's pretty likely that you won't have to worry too much about charging, as most of them have wireless charging or, at the very least, have an open USB port somewhere, so that is less of a concern. And from a hardware standpoint, that's really all I need to have all my bases covered. Now, that's all fantastic, just strictly speaking to the gear itself, but there's still a few things that I had to worry about when crossing the border when it came to the software side of things. The first being my mobile plan. If I really wanted to, I could just continue using my same mobile carrier with roaming, but that can get pretty pricey. I think they charge somewhere in the neighborhood of $15 a day, which, if you're staying somewhere for any length of time, can get pretty expensive, so rather than doing that, what I did was download an app called Aerolo. So what this app does is allow you to purchase a data plan specifically for the country that you're going to, and it just gives you an eSIM that you can add to your phone and use. With that, and just being aware of when and how you use your data, you can usually get by on five or 10 bucks a week. Just be aware that most of these plans are just with data only, so if you're messaging other people, you'll have to do it outside of SMS apps like WhatsApp, Signal, or Messenger, and you won't be able to call anyone through your regular phone number. They do have plans within the app if you do want SMS and calling, but for what they cost, you might as well just stick with your carrier at that point. I was a lot smarter using this on the way back to Canada versus when I went to the US. I burned through an entire data plan in a single day between maps and listening to podcasts on Spotify, so if you're going to be consistently using those kinds of things, the best way to go about that is to download the maps that you're going to use through Google or Apple Maps when you have access to Wi-Fi somewhere and whatever music or podcasts that you plan on listening to. That way you'll not only save yourself a boatload of data, but in the event that you hit a remote area with no signal, you won't have any disruptions. I prefer using Apple Maps myself because I find them to be just as good if not better than Google now at least for the places that I've traveled, and I like having the watch integration with vibration alerts for when I need to pay attention to directions, so if I'm out walking around, I don't look like a dork holding my phone out to guide me around. Speaking of network connections and Wi-Fi, whenever I go anywhere and have to connect to hotel or public Wi-Fi, I always connect to a VPN. Public networks are just generally pretty insecure, and whoever owns the network could be collecting your data and using it for marketing or selling it to third parties, and using a VPN just helps mitigate that a bit. I've tried a bunch of different VPNs, but I've used Winscribe for years now, and I love it. Decent VPNs are kind of tricky to find because most of the reviews views even on Reddit are often bogus or fake. So I've just stuck with them because it's snappy and stable and they have macOS, iOS and iPad apps that are all pretty decent as well. They also have a free option where you can get up to 10 gigs of data free that works really well. So if you're just gone for a week or two and you aren't doing anything too fancy, that's really all that you need. One last thing that I found really helpful that saved me some money and is partially related to software is making sure that I have the right payment cards and they're all set up in Apple Pay. I found using debit or credit cards themselves was pretty finicky when I got outside of the country just in terms of the cards reading properly every time, but Apple Pay seemed to always work and was a lot more predictable. It's also a little more secure than paying by card because it masks your payment information from the retailer. And just speaking to the card itself, I saved myself a little money there by using a Wise account. I use Wise somewhat regularly having to deal with different currencies a lot. The fees for conversion are generally a little bit less than a traditional bank, but the nice thing is I'm able to get a card from them that acts kind of like a prepaid visa where I can open up accounts in a variety of different currencies and transfer money to them, and if I make a transaction in that currency, it'll just take the value alone from that account. So let's say that I preload 500 bucks into a USD account. Instead of it charging me a fee for the currency conversion each time that I buy something, it just takes it out of my USD account without any added fees. So I'm not getting hit every single time that I buy something. I know that's not directly tied to the Apple ecosystem, but you can add that card through Apple Pay. And I think it's worth mentioning, given it can save you some cash. Outside of all of that, there's just a few random things that I want to mention that are worth looking out for or considering. I've talked about a fair amount of things in here, but let's say that you cheap out on something like a charger or an accessory and it 
craps out on you. If you're at home, it's usually not that big of a deal because you can just go get a new one or at least you know there are places where you can find replacements. But that's not always the case when you're traveling. This happened to me with my Apple Watch strap. I bought a couple of these cheap Amazon knockoff straps that look genuine, but I wanted to see how well they would hold up. And the answer was not great. The fabric actually pulled out from the buckle and my watch fell off my wrist while I was on the subway. I was really lucky that I had noticed it had fallen off and that I had easy access to an Apple store, but that could have just as easily gone very badly. Also, if you're charging your iPhone phone wirelessly while using maps and listening to music through CarPlay, make sure that your phone has enough room to breathe and that you don't put anything on top of it. My vehicle doesn't have the greatest charging spot and my initial reaction is to always throw my phone on the charger along with my wallet or my keys, which I did on this trip and I got my first overheating warning on my iPhone. I'd initially planned to use a car charger that clips onto my vent for this trip, but unfortunately I forgot it at home. But as long as I kept my phone loose without anything on top of it, it was fine. But that's just something to take note of. In terms of anything else that I'd wish that I'd brought and that I didn't, I could have used an SD card reader for when I decided to edit photos. I just ended up hooking up my camera directly to my MacBook Air via USB-C, which worked but was pretty slow. I probably should have taken one of my card readers with me, but this is one instance where I actually missed the built-in reader on the MacBook Pro quite a bit, but other than that, I was pretty happy with how everything went. That being said, my journey wasn't super far away, all things considered, and it was mostly just for fun and not for work or anything like that. And I'm sure many of you have your own great tips and tricks, so please drop those in the comments down below and let's see if we can help each other out there as much as possible. That's it for me today. I hope you found this video useful or enjoyable. If you did, feel free to hit that like button. If you'd like to see more tech related content or help me design a refrigerator that plays lo-fi beats anytime the door opens, please subscribe. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next upload.